Okay, so thank you mm -hmm. for joining me here. Um, we're going to talk today about one of John Maxwell's laws, the law of the lid, and just continual growth as a leader and as just a human being. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to start just by giving a little description on the law of the lid? Okay. So the law of the lid basically says that whatever a leader of an organization will define the growth or yeah, the size of that organization. So their leadership lid is right here. Basically, the organization is going to continually hit up against this lid, and it's never going to really be able to rise above that lid. And mm -hmm. so you might be a business owner, and you've grown your company to, let's say, five employees or something like that, and maybe a million dollars in revenue. And it took you a lot of different steps to get up to that point of that million dollars and that five employees. But just doing the same thing, coming into work every day, is not going to raise that lid. What's going to have to happen is you're going to have to evaluate your own kind of habits, your expertise. That you, might, like, you need to learn how to hire better. You might need to learn how to manage better. You might need to learn how to be a better marketer. There's lots of different skills that to you, move you up from a business owner of five employees and a million dollars to 10 or to 20 or et cetera like that. And if you want to keep growing your business, you basically have to keep growing yourself. And that can apply to churches, that can be applied to a teacher or a principal. Um, so kind of like the law of the lid is kind of a universal application for all of life. Yeah, and so like a practical example for students would be like the habits that gave you success in junior high aren't necessarily going to give you success in high school or university, right? And so increasing your capacity or shifting your capacity, right? Mm -hmm. Is that like a practical kind of understanding? Uh, maybe. I might say that a lot of the same habits that would get you success in grade 7 are probably quite similar to grade 12. Um, like, And a lot of times it might just be doing more work. Mm -hmm. um, because the skills of, you mean, further education, in my opinion, don't necessarily change a whole lot. Um, and they're kind of meta skills because you have to learn skills in grade 7. And so you have to learn skills in grade 12 as well. So I'd actually say they're quite similar, um, but it, to me, it's like the things that got you success in grade seven aren't necessarily the same skills that are going to get you a job or going to get you a girlfriend. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's kind of where I'd say is like you need different skill sets in that respect. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's a very clear understanding because like, if you're not following along, like the, the lid is no different than the ceiling, mm -hmm. right? And so whatever... Like whatever you're doing, whatever you're learning about, whatever you're trying to get better at, uh, if you keep doing the same repetitive stuff that you've done in the past, you'll get either the equal results or less, assuming you know, mm -hmm. if you're not doing it nearly as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so what are some consequences to keeping that lid or that ceiling at the same spot? Like, because I want to get into a discussion of like, what, like why bother growing, right? Especially mm -hmm. when you found a good niche or groove for yourself in life, mm -hmm. like why expand yourself? Um, it's a good question because that's where a lot of people get to. Like my previous boss, um, he had worked for a big grocery store company. And in that process, he was, he was a much more of a talking learner. I think you're very similar in that respect is that he would go to like the VP of operations and go interview them and just be like, Hey, like, why do we do this? Why do we do that? And kind of really understand the business. And kind of get this like basically real world MBA from kind of these professional executives because he was more like the expansions operation kind of person. But he would go around to all the different peoples in the company and learn from them. Mm -hmm. And then when he got his own company, he basically was able to grow it to about three to five million dollars a year in revenue. But he didn't have that growth anymore. Like he wasn't having people to go ask questions to and talk to. Basically, the people he spent time with were employees, which are basically below you or kind of family relatives were very similar. And so he wanted to grow. He wanted to expand to Red Deer, to Fort McMurray, kind of all over the place. But he was no longer growing. So his mm -hmm. lid was kind of capped. And he was not, you I mean, he had these dreams of going further. Um, but it is expensive. It is, it's not necessarily fun to grow because you have to look at the parts of yourself that aren't right. Like for him, he always liked to learn about marketing. And I love marketing too, getting, getting more sales, getting more leads. But it's kind of like putting... Um, a Dodge Viper engine into a Honda Civic. It's like at some point, <laughs> it's yeah. like you need to upgrade the frame, you need to upgrade like the tires, the suspension, all these kind of things. And so for in business, that's like you have to get better at hiring, you have to get better at managing, you have to get better at creating systems and getting good customer service and all these kind of things. 
And those aren't necessarily fun, especially for an entrepreneurial kind of guy. They're very much operations oriented. And that's just not what he wanted to do. Like I told him, it's like, hey, you don't need more marketing. You need more management. And he's like, yeah, I don't want to do that. And it's like, okay. Mm-hmm. And so right there, he expressed very clearly, like, here's my lid. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to go past that. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And so, like, what is your suspicion of, like, you know, why do you think he wanted to do that? Like, keep his lid there. Um, also, also before we do that, could mm-hmm. you clarify, like, in that advice, what do you mean by management? Because he's the boss, right? Yeah. And so what do you mean by that? We'll clarify first. Uh, well, so well, a lot of people, a lot of people are terrible at hiring. And so... Um, as a business owner or something like that, they'll tell you what they want. It's like, hey, I want you to do X, Y, and Z, and I want you to do it in this way and all that kind of stuff. And basically, all you need to do to get hired is just repeat back, oh yeah, I'm great at X, Y, and Z. Like, you mean I'm great at these three things that you say that you need. Um, but they could just be lying, you know I mean? Oh yeah, yeah. And it's right. like, you gave them, you basically give an answer key. It's like, imagine giving an answer key to the students and then being like, hey, you mean, it's like, oh, you mean, you guys all got 100%. Like, good for you. You must really know this stuff. And it's like, well, no. <laughs> like this one time that happened where, like the day before the test, I printed the test and realized the answer key was on the back. And so as I'm flipping through, like later that day, I'm like, oh my God, like the answer key's here. Like, I gotta throw this all out, right? Yep. So, yeah, like getting better at that hiring process. And, and so the management yeah, so it's one you have to hire better, and so I consider that a part of management as like mm-hmm. being a better manager. It's like you really it takes it takes a lot to figure out how to hire good people, mm-hmm. um, hire good people that work you mean in it, and then management too is that um, entrepreneurs tend to be quick starts. They like to start projects up, new ideas, doing it a different way each time, and that's terrible for management. As a manager, what you need to do is create consistent policies where you kind of do the same thing again and again. Um, and it just creates a lot more consistency in the business. And so what entrepreneurs as business owners and managers tend to do is they they are both arsonist and firefighter at the same time. Is that they come and put out some fires, put out some problems, but at the same time that they're lighting future fires for, you mean, that are going to grow up into bigger things into the future. Because they're starting new projects and it's like they're moving things around but not talking to anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, they just create problems at the same time as they fix problems. Um, and that just creates excitement for them because as a quick start, doing the same thing every day is, is just a special kind of hell. Um, so, <laughs> so they're just not very good managers. Um, mm-hmm. And so you need to take the time to consciously figure out what is good management and maybe recognize that you're not a good manager, but you have to know it in order to be able to hire it and get a good manager in your company and be able to let them do their thing and not come and mess it up all the time. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, and then so the consequences of staying in that same place, I think, I mean, to you and I, they might be self-evident, right? But, like, if you're just your standard run-of-the-mill person and you've been doing the same thing and getting mm-hmm. the same results and maybe it's not successful, right? Like, let's say, like, really good example uh for dating right like you go on a date mm-hmm. you talk to this person you think it goes well but then you get ghosted mm-hmm. right and and you continue you just run through this same cycle yep and so i mean in terms of growing it's like where should people kind of move towards um you know so like how would you define this process because there's that one style of like when we talk about the credit card pay paying back the debts. Mm -hmm. And so some people might say, okay, well, look at the biggest problem, solve that first. Mm -hmm. Other people might say, look at the quickest, like, problem that you can fix and solve that first. Mm -hmm. And so is there any particular strategy towards raising your lid? Um, So there's a few different pieces that I'd like to talk about there. So one, I'd say most people have a growth mindset in at least one or two areas of life. Um, So, you mean, some people have it in their job. Like, they just... They really like doing good work at their job and they like really figure it out and like kind of master that area of the job. So it might be how to impress the boss. It might be how to close sales, how to you mean make customers happy, whatever it is necessarily in your job. A lot of people will actually get pretty good at that, in particular men I'd probably say. Um, but then they neglect other areas of their life. So they might be sacrificing their health for their job and they might mm-hmm. be sacrificing their relationship for their job. Like... I was watching some heavy duty mechanic videos on YouTube and they're like, yeah, we're working like 14, 15 hour days every day. And I'm getting home at 11 PM 
then I have to spend an hour just typing out all the stuff I did that day, like ordering parts, sending it to the customers and what we did. And then I start again at five o'clock in the morning. And it's like, it seemed like he was quite good at his job, but it was like he was sacrificing so many other areas in his life for this. Uh, so one thing I would talk, try to encourage people is to have diversity in your life. So once you kind of get that success in the business, so let's say you're at the $5 million or whatever, that's my previous employer, um, to me, it not, doesn't necessarily make sense that you must, you go directly into learning management. It might make more benefit to learn how to create a better family life or how to get better with your health and stuff like that. And that in itself actually might increase your, your business problem without even directly mm -hmm. having it. Like your, your capacity goes up if yeah. other areas of your life have improved. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing I would say is that. I, I guess there's a saying about like, um, maybe the military or team say this, you're as strong as your weakest link, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so if that weakest link is really low, you know, like if something in the family breaks, there goes the business, right? Mm -hmm. If the family's the weakest link or health or yeah. uh, mental health as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and I think there's like kind of like the Carl Jung saying of like the, the cave that you, you the mean, cave you least want to enter is, has the, you know, treasure you, treasure most, you most see. Yeah. yeah. So that, that'd be kind of a good place to start is that we all have areas of our life um, like the corner in the closet that you means kind of become a mess and you've ignored um, whatever part of your area of life it is. It's and we mean literally as well. Right? Yeah, both like, literally and figuratively. Mm -hmm. um, th those are good places to kind of look into and try to work through and figure out. Um, and then how you actually go about with that is like you have to be very kind and generous to yourself. Um, so with like Dave Ramsey talks about the his kind of baby steps program for becoming debt free and wealthy and independent and stuff like that is that like the first step is just to pay off your lowest credit card balance first. So like the lowest, like the, the smallest that you have getting to pay that off first. Mm -hmm. so, so like paying the $500 debt rather than the $5,000. Yeah. Debt. And get some momentum. And so it's like, you mean get a small win because these areas that we're not good at are very, fragile like we're very weak in that area and we don't necessarily want to face it but if you get it's kind of like if you're facing dragons fighting dragons fighting a small dragon like a little you mean like the <laughs> mulan dragon that'd yeah, be a good yeah, place yeah, to start yeah. then like going after like a 20 foot dragon get going after kids. drogon from yeah. game of thrones exactly yeah. um so it's like do challenges that you can win ideally and then build confidence and build self-esteem from that Mm -hmm. And then I also think it's important to spend time learning about that topic or that area. Um, so like one of the areas I'm working on is health and diet right now. And so there's a book that I've really been enjoying, like the GAPS book, but it's so packed with recommendations that I'd read 10 pages of it and then feel like I have to change 10 things in my life and then it all fall apart and I wasn't reading it and I wasn't doing the changes. And so what I did was like, okay, I just want to get up in the morning and read maybe a chapter if the chapter is short, but maybe just two to five pages or something like that and slowly work my way through the book. So at least I have a comprehensive framework of what she's recommending, what her thought process is, what her philosophy is. And right now I'm on my last chapter. I just finished a sec like the second last chapter today. Nice. And so you mean it's like a 400 page book and you mean I've basically worked through 90% of it or something like that. And so that's a place to start. And then so you just want to get small wins, like what small pieces that you can kind of take in a reasonable time frame, that's going to add to the final result. And so um, let's talk about that. I did have a question from our previous point, but mm -hmm. let's talk about that first. So you just described that you're reading through a book and mm -hmm. not necessarily acting on the knowledge, mm -hmm. and particularly because you know it's maybe a fragile area of life. There's a lot of emotions attached and a lot mm -hmm. of uh, difficulty there. Um, now, for you and I, like, I mean, we like learning and we like the ideas and whatnot. And, mm -hmm. and, new ways of being but to someone who isn't that way like what is a logical explanation for simply just reading material and maybe not even acting on it mm -hmm. right um for me when i'm looking to grow into a new area develop in a new area i like to find ideally one mentor who i can follow and kind of build their philosophy into my intellectual framework so because if you kind of read very broadly about a topic or area, you'll find that everybody has a different way to say things. You mean, it's like, let's say it's in the muscle building. 
some people are all like high carb, like you just got a bulk, and then some people are like, you mean complete clean bulk, like no carbs at all, or something like that. And if you just read very broadly, looking for a general consensus to come, I find it's very unlikely for it to come, and it might even be the wrong consensus. And so what I find is better is to find kind of one person who you kind of jive with. It's like, hey, this person might have some similar traits as me, some similar life views, some whatever. And then really try to go deep into their material and then kind of decide after a certain period of time, three, six, 12 months or something like that, is this working for me? And if it is, let's keep going. Um, and if it isn't, let's go somewhere else. It's mm -hmm. kind of like mining for gold. It's like, if you just did a one Joe result in like, I mean, a hundred different places, it's very unlikely to get very much results. But if you kind of do drill results in one particular area and you find it seems to have some gold and then you start digging, eventually, you I mean, you'll either find it does have gold, it's working out or it doesn't and you can move mm -hmm. on. But if you don't actually give it a chance, there's, you mean, you didn't actually get to see if it has that value or not. I, I teach this to my students with writing. It's like, particularly when you're analyzing a source, you want to be specific about the, the main issue, the point you're trying to make. And the risk is like, okay, maybe you get the point wrong, right? So maybe you're following the wrong mentor. Mm -hmm. But the reward is if you're fine following the right mentor or making the right point, like that's how you get that 80, 85, 90, 100%. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right? 100%. Okay. So that's the same thing. Okay. The other question I had, so you talked about your old boss and the mm -hmm. company. And so um, particularly that he had, you know, two to $5 million business and maybe he wants to expand to a $10 million business. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe you already answered this, but is it, kind of is is that growth process the mentoring process linear like does he have to go to someone who has a 10 to 20 to million dollar business to learn those skills to figure out what he needs to do next because you made the comment of well when he became boss all the people he's surrounded by are employees so they're kind of below him in terms of knowledge and capacity mm -hmm. Is it linear that you have to find, like, let's say, like, you're single, you haven't dated someone in years. Do you have to find somebody who's, I don't know, had, like, 10 relationships or, mm -hmm. like, you know, you're, you're weak and feeble? Do you have to find someone who's very strong? Like, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that? Um, in the beginning, when you're not very good, I'd definitely say, like, that's the path. Um, so, like, when I was not very good with girls... Um, and I'd had some success with girls, but I never knew how to replicate it. It was basically like I was really good in school. So I'd meet girls in class and that would kind of go well because I felt very confident in class. And same thing with soccer. I was very confident in soccer. And so I'd kind of get girls on the team. But then when I took out to like the real world and I wasn't in school and I wasn't at university, it was awful. Like I had no idea how to attract girls. I got the wrong kind of girls. It was terrible. And then so for me, a big jump was one, I bought a bunch of programs and I started learning about it, but I also joined a fraternity and it had guys in there who were much more successful with girls and to them, it just wasn't a big deal. It's like, oh yeah, you just, you mean, just do stuff and whatever. And to me, that was just a real mental re reset because I like had built it up in my mind to be this big dragon. And then when I'd ask them about a certain problem, it's just like, oh, it's like no big deal. It just mm -hmm. happens. And then I was like, whoa, like. I mean, that's how it is. And so then after that, it just became so much easier. So in the beginning, that's definitely where I'd start. Uh, for kind of like my previous employer, it actually could go two ways. Um, so one option could be to get people who are better than him, like kind of mentor him and figure all that kind of stuff out and that'd be quite valuable. Um, but uh, the philosophy I actually take is more, one, I still, I still get mentors. I mean, I still listen to programs, all that kind of stuff. But I actually take more of a bottom-up approach. And so I actually would go down and try to help grow my employees up if I was in his position of like, hey, let's figure out like, what do you want in your life? Do you want to be working at this company? What are, you, you mean, what are your unique skill sets and figure that out? And I would try to build it up from the ground up. And so that's kind of trying what I'm doing here, like with you and Stephanie and stuff like that, is I'm trying to get you guys to become the best versions of yourself and naturally that will kind of buoy me up as well because I find one of the problems with kind of going after bigger and bigger people is they just get busier and busier and busier. Like I was listening to Russell Brunson talk about meeting Tony Robbins and it was like, yeah, like we got to meet and we were kind of cool. And then like three years heard nothing from him. And it's like, you mean it's there cause he's just busy. I mean, it's like, it's not whatever, but like there's just so many people going after them. 
and it's it's very similar to sports too. It's like, are you trying to go after the Le- LeBron Jameses of the NBA and try to sign them on, or are you trying to draft like the Stephen Curry you mean twelve years ago or something like that? And so I much prefer kind of like the Golden State Warriors of like let's figure out how to draft great talent, develop them, and then ideally keep them on our team for like the whole entirety of their career. Um, and that's kind of my perspective. And one of the great things about life is that uh, it's not nearly as obvious and as competitive. Like, you I mean, everybody can see that Steph Curry and Clay Thompson are great and the price goes up for that. Um, but in life, very few people can see greatness and can see talent, from my experience. Um, and really know what the value of it is. Because it's kind of like, like one of the analogies I had before was being a diamond cutter. Mm-hmm. Um, gem cutter. So it's like, I was thinking of that. Yeah. It's like you can find like a raw diamond or a raw emerald. It doesn't really look like much. It's but it's like it's the actual gem cutter who's able to cut it and really make it shine the best that it can because that's ideally what a good gem cutter does is they make it so that the, the light comes out the most brilliant from it. Um, and very few people know how to do that in my experience. And so mm-hmm. if you can do that in your life and make the other people around you better. Um, just everything in your life gets better. So, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about that. Like, how do you develop the the eyesight and the foresight to see greatness? Because, mm-hmm. like, you know, particularly in my position as a teacher, like, mm-hmm. I mean, I interacted with, uh, like, about 80 to 100 new people this year yep. as students, right? Mm-hmm. And some stick out and others don't many Mm -hmm. don't right and now but like maybe that's a problem with me Mm -hmm. or maybe that's a problem with circumstance of you know you just see these kids when they're 12 13 it's really hard to tell what's going to happen so how do you develop that skill right because then as if you are someone who's a leader or in a leadership position it's like Mm -hmm. you probably got there because you're competent already hopefully Mm -hmm. the system's working right and if you're self-reflective and forward thinking it's like you can kind of figure out how to raise up those other areas of your life to an extent Mm -hmm. or at least see like, "Eh, you know, I should maybe solve that problem too. Um, But this ability to see someone and recognize that, okay, there's some greatness there that I should maybe look to hone in on and develop. Mm -hmm. Uh, So for me, I look for a growth mindset as the thing that I found the most valuable because who somebody is today it doesn't actually matter to me. What actually matters to me is the attitude. And I think of attitude in actual technical sense. Um, so a plane has an attitude, uh, from my understanding. And basically that attitude is the direction. Is it going upwards? Is it going downwards? Is it staying the same? And so obviously a plane needs to have all types of different attitude. Like it needs to be able to go up, <laughs> down, yeah. level. Uh, but with people, I'm looking for an upwards-based attitude of like somebody who is looking for advice, ideally asking for it. Um, but like when they're given advice, they actually implement it and they do something with it. And ideally not with the heels drag, but even if it's with the heels drag, if they actually do something with it, great. So if you give advice to a student about how to better interact with girls, and then he implements that, and then a few weeks later he has a girlfriend, that's actually a pretty great sign. <laughs> you know yeah, I mean? yeah. But it's like if you give some advice and he's like, oh yeah, that's great. And then eight months later, nothing's happened. It's like, one, you may, you maybe your advice wasn't in the way that he could do, or maybe he needs more encouragement or something like that. But if that's kind of a consistent trend of like, they just don't do anything with anything. Yeah. Like we all know that one person who wants to hear like, oh man, I got this problem. Like, Mm -hmm. help me out, man. You'd give them some advice and then they come back a week later. Mm -hmm. Well, they leave super pumped. Like, oh, like finally I'm going to go dump that guy who's been treating me wrong. And then they come back a week later, like same problems. Oh, I couldn't do it. And I need more encouragement. Right. So, Mm -hmm. so, okay. So you look for a growth mindset, people who are, let's say optimistic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So like even like, uh, so last night we were over at uh, my friend Stephanie's, you mean family place. And she'd also gotten her sister and her mom, the gaps book. Mm-hmm. And so when her sister saw it, she was her she lit up and she was reading it at like the dining table and stuff like that. And it's like that's a really good sign. Um, her mom wasn't you mean my, Stephanie maybe not have presented it correctly, but you mean she kind of put the book away. Her mom didn't go look for it and didn't see it. And so 
to me, uh, I, her sister, in, in my opinion, is a lot higher altitude, at least in that kind of area of health and whatever, than her mom is at this point in time. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of what I'm looking for is like, and the more different areas that they're open to growing and learning in, the better it is. So it's like, you might have a student who's open and receptive of how to make their essay better, but if you kind of give them some advice about maybe how to get a job or how to get a, you mean, intimate partner or whatever it is, um, and they don't take those kind of things and they maybe get uppity about it, if you even give up the topic, to me, it, there's less potential there than somebody who can kind of grow in all different areas of life. Mm -hmm. And the receptivity is interesting, right? So like now that I'm teacher sponsoring the basketball team, mm -hmm. you know, so like when I was in high school, my, the coach of the team was like, all right, everybody, like game day, Monday, dress shirts, Monday, mm -hmm. like, you know, wear something nice. And, um, so l raising my own lid of understanding like, okay, well, why do we do that? And like, how do I encourage them? Mm -hmm. Right. And still working on that. But like, so far it's just the, the leading the example. Right. So I tell them like, Hey, you wear a dress shirt. Like I'll be wearing a suit. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'll be here. And so if you're feeling uncomfortable, don't worry. Cause like I'm wearing a suit mm -hmm. and at the end of the day, like I stand up more than you do, but I'm wearing a suit. But, um, uh, having that example there present and leading the way mm -hmm. and then seeing that. So like some of the kids, like most of the kids didn't wear one on the first day and, you know, they saw that I was wearing a suit and then, you know, one of the guys went home at the end of the day and came back before the game wearing like a dress shirt, dress mm -hmm. pants and like it looked yep. sharp. And then the next game, like a couple other people were in dress shirts and one guy was wearing a suit too. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, yeah, like that ability to recognize like, okay, these people are trying and they're striving. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, how do I help them out? Right. Mm -hmm. So like one guy, like he was wearing a suit and he had the bottom button, like the, he was standing and the bottom button was button. It's like, no, 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 that's like a no, no. Mm -hmm. And I just walked up to him like, Hey, like put my hand on his shoulders. Like, Hey, can I give you a tip? He's like, yeah, yeah, totally. And like, you only button the top one mm -hmm. when you're standing. Right. And he changed that and he took that example. And yep. so even in that regard, like when we step into that role of helping these people, like mm -hmm. you said, like being loving and kind mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, treating it like a plant that needs sunlight or like a, like, like think of like a baby chicken, right? Yep. Like it just needs warmth mm -hmm. and protection. And it's yep. like, okay, like this part of you is learning and growing. Mm -hmm. How do I foster that? So instead of clowning the kid or laughing at him, mm -hmm. right? Maybe I could have done it in a more subtle way, but I, I'm more of a direct person. So, Hey, like, let me adjust this for you. Like nobody else knows, just I know. And yep. now you know as well. Yep, 100%. And seeing that receptivity is like quite interesting, like even in the gym. Mm -hmm. And then taking like, uh, again, with the self-reflection. So I might have mentioned to you like a month or two ago, just also related to my purpose in life. and just realizing like, hey, when kids come up with questions, like it's not my job to just talk. Mm -hmm. How about I ask them what they're thinking mm -hmm. and see what their thoughts are and what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And so recently, like a week ago, this uh, grade nine kid who I don't teach mm -hmm. comes up to me in the fitness center. And he's like, Mr. Kwaja, like, uh, you know, I'm trying to like develop a workout pro program. Like, you know, can you take a look at the exercises I've put together? Mm -hmm. And he's got this push pull kind of split five day thing. And I, he's got two of the days sorted out. And I see like about 12, 15 exercises on those two days each. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, obviously the first reaction is like, oh, I got to tell this guy everything that's wrong and like adjust and fix it for him. Mm -hmm. And then I pause in that moment. It's like, no, no, hold on. Jeep. You told yourself you got to grow in this area. Like you got to mm -hmm. listen to what this kid's thinking and you got to help him sort it out. Mm -hmm. And so we had this process where I asked him a few questions, mm -hmm. saw what his mindset was, and then gave him some advice. And yep. the advice was more so like, hey, like take all these exercises, split this over a two week period. Mm -hmm. And try that for a while and see which exercises you like, which ones you prefer, which ones you continue to go back to, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, you're trying to hit chest. Give the bench press a try. Give the chest press a try. Give the pec fly. Do dumbbells and see which one you like. Like mm -hmm. maybe bench press bugs your shoulders, but shoulder press or chest press doesn't with dumbbells. Mm -hmm. Now you have that knowledge. Now you know what works for you. And now you know how you want to go forward. And so... Yeah, paying attention, I guess, to the people who either stand out. Sometimes it's like a subtle gut feeling, like there's something different about this guy mm -hmm. and it's hard to pick up on. But other times it's like, hey, like this person came up to me, they asked me a question, they got some feedback and then like, then they went and implemented it. And like this guy's like been going up in the gym, trying some stuff. So probably next week if I see him, I'll be like, hey, like how are your workouts going? Mm -hmm. yep. And then even another kid, like, 
you know, he's up there as well and he's working out and we're having like conversations and just realizing like he responds really well to like high fives, right? Mm -hmm. Like he just wants that little bit of attention and, yep. and it's interesting. And so you're coming to the, you're presenting the idea that like we want to see demonstrable action towards solving a problem, let's mm -hmm. say. And that's how you recognize greatness. Mm -hmm. And the more problems and more areas, like, um, so health is one thing. So it's like, okay, like, great, this kid's very receptive on mm -hmm. workout, stretching, and all that kind of advice. But then everything else, they're like, no, 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 mm -hmm. they're closed off. And so you want to see not just receptivity to how do I solve this problem, but also receptivity to, okay, I have a problem in several areas of my life. Help me out here. Yeah, so ideally you don't want to necessarily overwhelm people kind of like the fire hydrant um so like with my mom with her being like thirty five thousand dollars in credit card debt you mean a few years ago it's like okay let's just work on the financial it's like you you have a number of areas in your life that are not in the best order but let's at least get the financial kind of taken care of and now she's got that debt completely paid off and she's kind of got dealt with all her investment houses and her finances is kind of like gotten a lot cleaner and a lot easier to manage mm -hmm. like now we're kind of working on to the health area of her life so it, you don't want to necessarily inundate somebody with like you mean okay you have to change all areas of life right now but there's much more potential in somebody who has that openness of like okay let's work on the financial area of life let's work on the health area of life let's work on the relationship and the business and all that kind of stuff or even ask them like okay like hey your life's if, if you're telling me like hey your life's a mess well, which part do you want to work on first, mm -hmm. right? And seeing, like, because, you know, especially for a young guy, they might want to be like, hey, you know, I'm kind of scrawny and I don't like that. So, mm -hmm. like, uh, how do I build more muscle? It's like, okay, let's solve that. Mm -hmm. And then that potential, especially for men, like, that physicality will solve a lot of problems or lift up a lot of problems yep. to a more manageable place. Um, but, yeah, I was even talking to a friend this morning about, like, sharing like kind of my my viewpoints and what i've learned from you as well mm -hmm. but then having that positive encouraging mindset of like you know because it's it's so difficult to change what you've been doing especially mm -hmm. if you've been doing it for a while and you know you haven't seen any major consequences or repercussions mm -hmm. and you know or like all of a sudden your life situation switches and it's like oh i can't be like that anymore i have to change and so mm -hmm. Coming back to that again, kindness and being loving towards the areas that need growth mm -hmm. seems to be, you know, one of the best ways to encourage. Mm -hmm. Now, my question is, let's shift to, you know, let's say you're a little underling and, you know, the people above you or whatever is going on, like your boss or like mm -hmm. your partner or your parents, they're not growing. Like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. let's talk about that. Like, what are your experiences in the, that, that with that dilemma? And like how you solve that problem um, it's a tricky one especially if you are growing yourself um, so like I've had a number of different jobs and like one I was working at Commonwealth Stadium in like the kitchen or whatever and um, there's there's always things to learn in the beginning is one thing I'd say so it's like if you start a job in a kitchen or a grocery store at McDonald's there's things to learn and I think Ness, especially quick starts we like to learn in the beginning um, so like any job I could do for probably two or three months and actually quite enjoy it because it's like, hey, you know, I'm going to learn what's all going on here. Um, but ideally, it's like you can use that to grow and learn yourself. Um, and so like, let's go back to like my previous job um, with the company. It's like the first two years I worked on that, or I worked on marketing and I learned how to market the company. And that was a very intensive process because I really didn't know marketing, even though I went to business school, even though I listened to all these marketing programs. I had no idea what actually worked in the real world and it turned out to be relatively simple, but it wasn't simple to figure it out. Um, so it took me about two years to figure it out. And then it got to the point where my marketing was working so well that I was overwhelming the business. Like the business was just inundated with calls and customers. And so basically like the, my boss called me and was like, Hey, like, you mean we can't even answer the phones. We can't deal with customers. I need you to start coming in to the showroom and helping out here. And at first I was really not excited for that, but, Kind of like the next step for me was the next two years was learning management so it's like i mastered marketing and marketing was quite easy to me but the next step was learning marketing or learning management it's like how do i help out uh, people there how do i create processes that make everything easier because um, i didn't necessarily want to be in the fray doing all the work but i wanted to make things more simple for everybody and so i spent a lot of time learning that 
Um, and that was very valuable. And then it got to a point where it was time to move on. So I kind of put it in the category of the, the story of the alchemist. Um, kind of like how he had first become a good sheep herder or whatever it is, shepherd. And he did well with that. And then he was called on to his dream. So he went across to Africa or whatever and got all his money stolen because he was kind of not very smart. And then he worked for that glass salesman or whatever. And he kind of learned how to do that well. He learned how to merchandise and he learned how to get good customers and how to, you mean, really pick up that business. Because I think they said it increased by like three or four times in sales. And then so he built up his kind of money and he saw that the owner, even though the business was doing better and stuff like that, the owner hadn't changed his mindset about going and doing, I can't remember what the trip is. He wanted to go do the Islamic pilgrimage to yeah. Mecca. Yeah, so that. He had all his friends doing it or whatever, but he wasn't willing to do it himself. And even though like financially it seemed like he was in the best point in time right now, it's like, hey, I've got this good kind of like underling who's taking care of the store I and I've got the money. I could probably go do it at this time, do my Mecca, and I wouldn't lose my store. Uh, right, that reciprocal act of like, hey, if you help me follow my dream, mm -hmm. I'll help you follow yours, right? But he wasn't interested in that at all, no. like you mean? So that's kind of the point to me that you realize it's like, okay, it's time for me to move on. It's like, if you've kind of like grown, learned, made the best out of it, because some people go into those situations and they just, you mean, poo-poo it and, oh, my boss sucks, my employees, you mean, coworkers suck, all that kind of stuff. It's like, no, it's like, you got to make the best of what you can. And he did that, you mean, he improved things and made it a lot better. But then there's a certain point when you realize it's like, hey, I, I can't really keep growing here. Like, I can't. You mean, this isn't a business that I could expand, like, three different locations. And it's not even aligned with his mission, right? His mission was to go to the pyramids in Egypt or whatever. So it's like, okay, so now is the time to kind of lead on. Um, and I felt that very much. It's like, okay, there just wasn't, for that for the previous company, even though I was making lots of money, um, it just didn't make sense anymore. And especially when COVID hit, it's like, okay, but that, that's kind of like the real last chord for here. Um, and then now even with math tutoring, I've gotten to the point where it's like, I've gotten very good at it. So I understand kind of the whole framework of how I do this, uh, but it just doesn't make a difference. It's like, I get, I can teach my students, get them into the nineties or something like that, but it doesn't really change anything. And like m basically the math you learn in high school doesn't have any real applicability beside from maybe university and a little bit in a particular job, but at most it's 10%. And so for my mission, my purpose is to make the world a better place. That math tutoring doesn't necessarily align with it. Like it was mm -hmm. more in alignment than my previous job, but it's like, I'm hoping to have the next, like the personal, like the seniors personal training business to be more in alignment than the current math tutoring business. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Uh, I don't even remember the question anymore. I think it's like, when do you, what do you do with, you mean managers or bosses who aren't growing? Thank you. Um, you know, the alchemist is a great example of what to do in that situation, right? Because for that young man to fulfill his dream, he has to let go of that, mm -hmm. like, really great opportunity, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm sure he could have lived a pretty good life had he just stayed there, but... Mm -hmm. There's a definitely desire to kick up your legs and be like, hey, I got this mate. You mean? So yeah. I'm doing like two hours work a day and I'm making, you mean, like 16 hours worth of, you mean, income. Mm -hmm. It's like, I could just live pretty here. Um, it's tough to give that up, but that's where the, like, the fun of life is, in my opinion. It's kind of like playing a game that you've already beaten. It's like you just keep going around. Like you've, gotten all, <laughs> you've gotten all the masks, yeah, yeah, you've gotten all the yeah, hearts, yeah. you've gotten all the swords, and you're just like, oh yeah, just like you one slice and all the monsters die. And it's like, uh -huh. do you just want to keep playing that or do you want to go on to the next game and kind of struggle through it but have a lot more fun and enjoyment? And I think that ties in closely with the question of particularly with growth and leadership of what vision do you have for your life, mm -hmm. right? Do you even have a vision for mm -hmm. your life, you know? Um and for me, like, I'll be honest and upfront, like, I got quite distracted this semester just with the workload. Mm -hmm. But this last week, kind of with the semester wrapping up, like, getting back into that, like, what is my vision for myself as a teacher? And how do I implement that? Mm -hmm. and even, like, now I have some ideas from Montreal. And, like, coming back to some ideas I had left uh, or shelved for mm -hmm. the time being, of like, you know, because one of the things I want to do with this last few weeks is I was debating rolling over in my head, like, should I read The Alchemist to my grade nines and give a commentary? tell them like because it is the hero's journey it's like okay mm -hmm. like i could do that and then 
when I thought of that idea, it's like, oh, like, hey, you still have to build more resources on Animal Farm because that's such a great resource there that can be done for the social studies. Uh, and then from there, it's like, like, hey, what about this life planning thing? Like, you got to <laughs> sort that out before like the next semester, hopefully. Mm-hmm. And then realizing once, and then again, like once you start on that process, you get more clarity. Like, what should I be doing? How should I be growing? Mm-hmm. Right? Because then it occurred to me, like, okay, like the mindset. Because I asked a bunch of grade twelves, so I gave them that same sheet, and like, what do you think of these questions? Mm-hmm. Like, which ones stick out to you? Which ones would you actually want to answer? Mm-hmm. Um, now, and then they're like, yeah, this is really good. Like, this would be nice to do. Mm-hmm. And then I asked them the ultimate question of like, okay, like, could you have answered these in grade nine? And they're like, oh, no, no, no. Like, mm-hmm. it wouldn't have made sense. So it's like, oh, okay. So clearly for grade nines and tens, it's got to be a different uh, approach, right? And maybe more for, so for high school. And for the elevens and twelves, like, still have a lot of those same elements, but mm-hmm. then tie in that, like, next step of your life. Mm-hmm. And so in a way, it's like an, uh, developing the capacity to coach people like think about that next step in your life i guess patrick bet david has the book the next five moves mm-hmm. right and i haven't read it but like that same idea of like what are you going to do next mm-hmm. right because you know we we certainly live in a time where it's very easy to just keep scrolling away and like <laughs> distract yourself with instagram then tiktok then snapchat then instagram then youtube then snapchat then tiktok yeah. and it's like well, if the next five moves of your life are just the next five apps, you know, it comes back down to like, well, what is your vision for your life? Mm-hmm. So maybe we can wrap up with a discussion of, you know, how do you, what advice do you have for people or young kids, especially mm-hmm. like, how do you develop a vision for your life? How do you develop a vision, let's say even for the next five years, which might be more relatable for, you know, a high school kid? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a, it's a tricky question. And one thing I would, um, I guess what I would have wished to heard of before is it's not necessarily easy because when I listen to a lot of people talk about finding your mission, finding your purpose and kind of David data's kind of saying is like to sit in a room alone until it comes, um, might be two weeks <laughs> of sitting in a room, right? Yeah. And, and to me, it's, he had a different saying. It's like, Maybe, maybe it wasn't him, but I can't remember who it was. But they're basically like, focus on your problems. So deal with your problems and kind of let that guide you in a lot of sense. Um, so as you mean a grade 12 student coming out of high school, um, a big problem could be finding work. And so it's like, how do you get a job and learning that? And then there's, there's a lot of optionalities with today's world. Like I've been watching a lot of Maud Merck, I think is his name. And he's like a subway guy. He basically just like has a camera as he makes subway sandwiches. And then for the most part, he just does a commentary. So he does like two to four minutes of maybe making sandwiches while he talks over it kind of in post, like post-production of like, you mean talking about topic, you mean reading Google reviews that he's got or crazy stories from customers or crazy stories from employees. <laughs> okay. Um, That's pretty interesting. It is, you mean? And so it's like, and then there's another guy, Dylan something or other, who did the same thing, but with like ice cream. So like um, the cold slab, whatever, like mm-hmm. where they flip the ice cream and all that kind of stuff. Basically same thing, just records him making stuff, making ice cream cakes, making, do you mean like the little ice cream balls. And just blew up on TikTok and YouTube and stuff like that. And his goal was actually to start his own ice cream shop in New York. And now he's made that happen. And... I look at that and think like, that's got to be a living hell. Um, but you mean that's his life and that's what he wants to do. Great. Um, but, uh, it's, so it's kind of like, it's just experimenting and going with what you've got. And it's kind of like, I look at it as like the golden snitch. So I'm playing Harry Potter, like in the, uh, Hogwarts Quidditch. Quidditch yeah. yeah. It's like chasing this, the snitch is the kind of like the big thing that wins games or not. And I look at it as like, what is, what's that thing that, that kind of glimmers with your interest that's exciting to kind of go after and pursue that and it'll kind of take you up down all over the place and it's not going to be easy journey to try to catch it but taking you through that it's going to be like the most excitement because to me that's where the fun is is watching harry potter kind of compete with the other seeker going after that snitch it's like that's where the fun is in the game because you mean putting the ball through like the hoop and getting like two points is like who cares but like whatever like like this this is like worth like 80 points or something. Well, like a that. snitch ends the game, right? Yeah, like, that too. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I think it's like 80 points in ends a game or 150 or whatever it is. Um, and so that's kind of what I think in life. So it's like being willing to exp experiment with different jobs. And if you go to university, different classes and different student groups and testing things out, because we have a tendency to want to lock things in and be like, okay, I'm going to go to school for engineering and I'm going to do five years or four years and then I'm going to become a mechanical engineer and I'm going to do this, this, and this. We hope to become one. Yeah. Not, not a barista. And it's like, <laughs> um, engineer is not as the same as uh, if you're doing like women's studies or whatever, you know, <laughs> um, historical English literature. Um, but uh, so it's being willing to experiment and try and see what, what interests you. And then I find as you experiment, your vision gets clearer. So like with the personal seniors, personal training business, I experimented with my kind of weight training X3 program first, like about two or three years ago and kind of played with it and had some success and had some failures with it. And now coming back to it, you mean a couple of years later, I'm in a much better place to kind of understand it and stuff like that. And so I think it's very important to experiment and to try different things. And then your vision becomes clearer over time through that experimentation process. That's good. Mm -hmm. We'll end at that. Sounds good. Thank you.